Okay, so welcome everybody for our 2021 Tips and Tricks webinar series. We are here live from Augusta, Georgia, uh, and I want to thank you for being part of this. I want to thank you for signing up. Uh, today, we're going to talk about tips and tricks for endo crowns. Now, it's important for you to know that endo crown is a very general term. Uh, today, on lace is what the normal term would be for uh, this type of restoration. They have now, uh, today they have many or multiple type of different names that are used to describe a restoration that kind of is the same as an onlay crown or an onlay restoration. So you will, you will find names such as endo crowns, onlays, vonlays, occlusal tabletops. They're all very, very, um, they have dif very small differences between one and the other, uh, but they all have the same go end goal in mind and is to preserve as much tooth structure as possible. So I'm gonna share with you today some cases that are related with endotreated teeth, as well as some cases uh, for vital teeth, just to share with you that the principles of preparation are, are basically the same, uh, but obviously the way that you're gonna bond these restorations, the way that you are going to deliver the restoration may change from one patient or from one uh, clinical case to another. So the first thing I want to do, as I we usually do, is I want to let you know that once we are done with this webinar, um, you will visit our webpage and you will be able to obtain a one CE credit, free CE credit for this presentation. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors. This year we have new sponsors for our webinar series, uh, some new ones that have joined us this year. And thanks to all these companies that you see on my screen: Coltine, Cavo Kerr, BNR Dental. Comet, Garrison, and Romero Dental Seminars, you will be, uh, receive one free CE credit for this presentation. All you have to do is that at the end of the presentation, I want you to visit our webpage, RomeroDentalSeminars.com. You will find our homepage there. And once you are in that main page, I want you to select, you can either go to live webinars, and you will find all the topics that we're gonna have there for this year, as well as the links to, uh, to be able to uh, save your seat for one of the web live webinars that we will have throughout the years. The next link is the on-demand link. And this link is where we save all the previous webinars and recorded webinars so that you can you know, re-listen to them if you needed to for a specific topic, or maybe you were not able to make it in the morning on our live webinars. You can then uh, see it at any time in your own, in the comfort of your own home in our on-demand channel. You can do it through our webpage or you can visit our YouTube channel at Romero Dental Seminars. And finally, we have a third link that is our CE Quizzes link. And after we are, we've completed our presentation today, you're gonna go to that link and you're gonna find a PDF file. Uh, I will make sure that I will upload that PDF file right after I'm done today in the morning. And once you do that, you can download that file. You can complete the five questions that we have there. Add your name, your license number, the state that you are in, and your membership number if you are a member of the Academy of General Dentistry. And we will make sure that we will get these sent out for you and we will send you a copy as well. If you're not a member of the Academy of General Dentistry, but you're a member of the American Dental Association, we will give you your certificate so that you can go ahead and submit it for your credits. Uh, so please make sure that you take advantage of this because we do give you uh, that one CE credit for this live webinar. The objectives for my presentation today are very simple. Objective number one is to understand how to best prepare onlay restorations. And I want to, uh, I know that there's a, a couple of typos there, but, but please uh, excuse me for that, but it's onlay restorations. Understand how internal geometry can benefit an uh, endocrine type of restoration. And finally, how to effectively bond an onlay restoration using a universal dental adhesive. So let's go to tip and trick number one. So the first thing that a lot of people uh, uh, ask me when I'm lecturing uh, about a topic like this is, you know, how strong are these partial restorations compared to a full uh, uh, coverage restoration? Well, the first thing that I want to tell you is that when you perform a full coverage restoration, keep in mind that you are removing 
completely the dental enamel junction, which as we know is what helps the tooth have uh, strength and integrity. So when you prepare a crown, yeah, the crown is going to protect the tooth, but the amount of tooth structure that you are removing in order for you to be able to deliver that restoration is what weakens the actual tooth structure. So when you compare a partial restoration versus a full, a full coverage restoration, the benefit of the partial restoration is that you are maintaining the great majority of the tooth. You are uh, trying to eliminate as minimal as possible. You eliminate just where the actual lesion or the area that you need to protect uh, of the tooth just to go back and restore it but you're trying to keep as much of the actual natural tooth structure available as possible. And there's two reasons for that. Reason number one, again, you want to try to maintain as much as you can that DEJ, but reason number two is because you want to try to conserve or preserve as much enamel as possible so that you can make sure that your bonding procedures are behave well on that substrate. So this is a study that was published in 2020 in the, in the Journal of the Academy of Operative Dentistry where they were looking at the fracture resistance of the remaining buccal cusp in maxillary premolars for ceramic onlay restorations. Now again, this has everything to do with the type of preparation that you will be doing. And the thing that they did here, the, the important aspect of this study that I found very, very clever and important was that, you know, the question that we always have is, do we really have to always cover the entire occlusal surface or can we just manage by partially covering the occlusal surface and leaving some of that non-functional cusp uh, without any preparation. And what they did here, this is a bench top study, and what they did here is that they selected multiple premolars, and as you can see, they did four different types of preparations. And the control was an intact tooth, a tooth that had no preparation, a premolar that had no preparation. And what I want you to see here is that on every, the, 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 the differences, let me go back once, the differences between the designs were actually that on the first type of preparation, they left three millimeters of that, of that non-functional cusp without any preparation. On the preparation number two, they left two millimeters of that non-functional cusp without any preparation. Preparation number three, they left one millimeter of remaining uh, enamel of that non-functional cusp and on preparation number four all the cuts were prepared now this again this study was uh, designed so that what they wanted to look for is would any of these type of preparations or mainly the number four type of preparation the one that they prepared the entire all the cuts was going to make the restoration stronger and was going to protect the tooth more because again that's the idea that we have when we're looking for these partial coverage restorations now, when you look at the results of the, once they completed all the preparation of the teeth, you know, they put them on, the, on this machine where they stress that buccal cusp and they uh, all the way up to it fractured. And what, what I want you to look at here is that they had the two groups are here. You can see the restored group on the left side, the non-restored group on the right side. And you can see the four different type of preparations, three millimeters, two millimeters, one millimeter, and the overlay. And what I want you to see is that Every single preparation, there was no statistical difference between covering the whole occlusal surface compared to leaving three, two, or one millimeter. So in other words, what they found in this study was that bonding and partial restoration, regardless of the type of preparation that you have, strengthens the tooth. And that is really what I want you to look into this. And here is the conclusions. This study determined that a one millimeter thickness of a remaining buccal cusp in bondable partial coverage restorations is sufficient to withstand normal use of the tooth without breakage. Other sections of this study were able to clarify outstanding questions about designing partial coverage restorations conservatively, information that should be of good use during treatment. And it is, because again, what did I say at the beginning of my presentation? One of the main reasons why you want to do partial coverage restorations is that you want to have enough available enamel for you to be able to bond to uh, uh, bond this restoration well. If you think about it, when you're doing full coverage crowns and you prep your crowns all the way to the gingival margin, there's very little to no enamel left for you to bond that restoration. So all the only option that you would have is to mechanically retain that restoration onto that substrate. So when you think about this, the way that we need to prep these 
these partial restorations is really very basic. There is no there is no specific way of preparation. There, it really depends on the tooth that you're working on, and it depends on the availability of tooth structure. Now, there's one thing that this study did not consider. Again, I still think that this is a good study because what this study is telling me is that I know that I can prepare. I have multiple designs, and every single one of these designs is going to benefit from the bonded procedure that I'm going to use to uh, deliver the re this restoration. Now, that being said, it is crucial for us to understand that if I need to bond this restoration, I need to have the correct environment for me to be able to bond to which means good isolation and good management of the substrate. And we do have a webinar exclusively on rubber dam isolation. There's a two hour webinar. We have two, uh, part one and part two, that I would highly encourage you to watch if you haven't in our channel so that you can get into that, uh, the specifics and the advanced rubber dam isolation techniques. But first, I'm going to start with this case right here. And again, our webinars, our tips and tricks webinars is all about clinical dentistry. And what we want to do is try to share with you as much clinical information as we can. Again, I was trying to say that one of the things that this study did not view is, okay, you have a partial coverage restoration with one, two, or three millimeters of that buccal cusp remaining in your preparation. Well, what happens to the interface between the ceramic and the tooth where you still have some cement remaining? How would that behave long term? The cement that is going to be in between that ceramic and the tooth structure on that occlusal surface compared to having the same cement on the buccal surface if you cover the buccal cusp. So those are things clinical. That's a clinical question that I ask myself and the reason why I personally like covering the buccal and the lingual cusp. But again, there's enough evidence to say today that if you do have enough suit structure and you can get away from, you know, from having any occlusal forces right in between that junction between the, in the ceramic and the enamel, uh, it, it is, it's still a really good type of preparation. In the case that I'm sharing with you right now in the morning, you can see why I'm going to remove this amalgam. There's some decay on the, on the mesial aspect, interproximal aspect between these two teeth. We have this fractured amalgam with a completely open margin on the buccal surface. So the amalgam has, has, has served its purpose. We are ready to remove this amalgam and you can see the shape of that amalgam. And now we're going to go ahead and remove the amalgam. So here, what I have done is I have removed the amalgam. I have removed the caries that was in the proximal, mesoproximal surface. And this is what I have remaining. Now, the most important aspect here is that the functional cusp of this premolar is the buccal cusp. And you can see that that buccal cusp has already has some signs of wear and a little bit of erosion right on the middle. So I want to make sure that I'm going to cover that cusp in any way I can to protect it. On the lingual side, you know, the other thing that I want you to consider is the isthmus. Look how wide this isthmus is. So because I have such a wide isthmus, I'm going to make sure that I protect this lingual cusp again. And again, this is just my philosophy, my personal clinical preference. But the first thing that I'm going to do before I go ahead and do anything else, and you can see that my rubber dam is already in place. So I've already been able to achieve really good rubber dam isolation. I've been able to invert my rubber dam so that all the margins of my preparation are now exposed. And if you look at my preparation, the first thing that I want you to think about is, okay, so in order for me to be able to prepare this tooth as conservative as possible, considering the amount of tooth structure that I'm already missing, is my first step is going to be, let me try to build some of that missing tooth structure back. And the way that I know how to do that, and we know, me and you know how to do that, is by a core buildup restoration. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to build up my core. You can see this is the this is the amalgam that we have. You can see how much more tooth structure I, I needed to remove in order for me to get this uh, ideal preparation, remove the caries, and make sure that this is something that works for me. This is now the enamel, the surrounding or the peripheral enamel that I have available for me to bond to. So I have good peripheral enamel. I have a nice and clean surface. I have a nice and dry surface. I am able now to go ahead and isolate that tooth with a, uh, this is now a, a matrix band. This is a retainer less type of matrix band that I like a lot when I'm doing my core buildup material, my core buildups. And as you can see, I'm going to wedge, I'm going to seal everything. And the most important thing that I'm going to do now is I'm going to acid edge prime and bond. And I'm going to do this in two separate steps. 
and depending on the depth of the dentin, I have to select one adhesive versus another adhesive uh, type of uh, technique or protocol. Now, we are going to have a webinar that is going to discuss entirely everything you need to know about bonding these type of uh, multiple type of restorations. So I'm not going to go into depth into the way that I did it here, but what I want you to visualize is that right now, when I acid edge, I prime and bond, and I build up my core, at the same time, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to seal my dentin, seal everything that I have around in that area, make one big block of dentin, enamel, and composite, so that now I can go ahead and prep this tooth. So now I have given this tooth, I have given this tooth back, it's a better or a more integral aspect of a buildup, meaning that I have a stronger core, I have integrated buccal and lingual walls, I have composite on my proximal walls, and now I have, I'm gonna treat that core buildup material as my dentin as whatever, uh, as the dentin that I was missing that now I'm going to incorporate into my preparation. Now, the question that I always get is, what kind of burrs would I need to use in order for me to prep uh, this type of restorations? And to be honest with you, I mean, there's, there is a very nice system out there that I would highly encourage you uh, that is for onlay type of restorations and is made by Comet, which is a beautiful system. And we're going to share it with you. We're go actually going to have a live hands-on course on how to prepare these type of restorations using specifically designed burrs for this, uh, for these, uh, type of restorations. So please uh, stay, you know, uh, stay connected and make sure that you find out when this live webinar, hands-on webinar is going to be, it's only going to be for 15 participants. So hopefully you can join us there. Uh, but for now, what I do want to tell you is that I use these basic chamfer burrs. I'm not using the Comet system yet. I'm just using this basic chamfer burrs and I use either the medium chamfer or the wide chamfer, as you can see on the left-hand side of my screen. And you can see these are the typical chamfer burrs that we would use for any type of crown preparation where we want to have a chamfer type of margin. And I use an enhance point. And I, and I combine these depending, I'm going to select the burr depending on the amount, the size of the tooth and the amount that I want to reduce. And I'm going to always use an enhance point just to go ahead and polish everything uh, after I prepare just to get a nice and smooth preparation. So again, I'm just using these basic burrs and I'm gonna walk you through the process. This is now my completed preparation. And as you can see, I completed this preparation under rubber dam isolation. You can see a little bit of the burr that hit the rubber dam on this area, I'm not worried about that. But what I want you to see is that I'm gonna go back, I want you to look at my, my margin, 360 degrees of enamel very nice solid clean enamel all around this area this is the area where we had the class the mod preparation this is the missing buckle wall that we have and you can see that i have been able to rebuild those with that uh with my core built the material but all i'm doing right now is like a little like a tabletop literally i'm just covering that occlusal surface following the anatomy of the prep, my, my, the anatomy of my preparation follows the anatomy of the remaining two structure that I had. But look at the thick enamel band that I was able to achieve all around the preparation. And why do I want you to look at that, uh, at that band of enamel? Because I want you to look at the burr, and I'm gonna go back one slide, and I want you to look at this burr. This tip of the burr I, is facing always either buccal, mesial, distal, or lingual. That's the orientation of the burr in order for me to get this type of preparation. And again, my ultimate goal is to just get as much enamel exposed as possible in order for me to be able to bond my restoration or my final restoration. This is a buckle view of the preparation. And you can see this is immediately after removal of the rubber dam. This is the same day of preparation. Remember how deep that proximal, the distal proximal box was. So I'm just following and you can see how much enamel I was able to expose in that area. I, ha I have covered um, that uh, uh, buckle wall missing on the distal aspect with my core builder material. That nice and highly polished surface that I was able to achieve with my enhance point. The nice flow of this margin. The margin does not need to be straight. All I'm doing is just flowing around my preparation depending on you know 
uh, what the anatomy of the actual cavity was before I went ahead and prepped. So all I'm doing is I'm just trying to follow the contours of that of the cervical line of my preparation. And you can see this is the lingual aspect. You can see how the lingual aspect was able to join. Now the distal aspect, look at the thickness of the enamel and then the dentin up here. So again, everything is nice and round, a very nice flow of the preparation, which obviously is going to allow a full seating of my ceramic restoration when I get the restoration back from the lab. So one more thing you can see there, the ring of enamel. Again, I cannot stress how important this is. This is very important because that's exactly where your restoration is going to be able to bond to. And that's where you're going to get your best bonding. And we all know that. The other aspect of this is that now I know that I can isolate the substrate because I isolated it from my preparation. So I know that I'm going to be able to isolate it well for my delivery of the restoration. And one more thing that I want you to look at is this little notch that I created on the mesial aspect. The reason why I do that, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna see this on every, not every uh, lecturer out there recommends this little notch, but there is one reason why I recommend this. There's a lot of these preparations that I do that are very, very conservative, meaning that my preparation is very minimal. And the, one of the most difficult things that I have found in my hands, that I have found that, uh, that uh, you know, can become a problem upon delivery is how do I stabilize the restoration? How do I make sure that the restoration is going in and seating exactly where my mar where, where it should sit on top of the margins? Because if you think about it, not on not in this particular case, but on a case where you're going to have a minimal preparation, this restoration is going to be able to go left and right, up and down without any without anything uh, keeping it in place because the restoration does not have large walls. You don't need these large walls to prepare. You don't need a, a ferrule effect because you know you're going to be bonding to. So th the reason why I recommend this little notch is just to guide the fully seating of your restoration and to avoid the restoration from going left to right. In other words, it's giving your restoration a little bit of stability. And this, this type of geometrical feature that I do inside my preparation really depends on the type of, uh, of the tooth structure that I'm going to restore, of the vitality of the tooth. Is this a vital tooth or is this a non-vital tooth? In this particular case, this is a vital tooth. So I'm going to just do a very small one just in order for me to have that little, little indentation in the restoration and have a really nice path of insertion for my restoration and make sure that my restoration does not rotate. So again, I give my, I, this allows my restoration to have a little bit more stability. So that was my tip and trick number one. So what is my tip and trick number two? My tip and trick number two is now exactly, I'm going to go into the details of that additional geometry that you can give your restorations when they are non-vital teeth. And I always like to do this because again, what it allows me to do is just allow that passive and, 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 and very nice stable restoration when I'm delivering the restoration. So this is a really good example for that extra or added geometry. I am going to go ahead and restore this tooth using an endo crown type of restoration. In other words, this tooth already had a root canal done. So there's two ways that you can do this. You can, you know, go in and uh, prepare some of that uh, uh, pulp chamber and make sure that you have some of that stability added in that pulp chamber of your endotreated tooth. Or sometimes I don't like to get into the pulp chamber because if there's whatever reason that I need to go back into that tooth to redo the root canal or the endodontist needs to go back and redo the root canal, they're going to they're gonna have to go through a lot of ceramic to get all the way down there. So what I like doing is I like doing it at a two-step. I like first filling up that pulp chamber and I use a core builder material for that. And then I build up a second floor. In this particular case, I'm doing what I call a deep margin elevation technique. Again, we're going to have a full webinar on deep margin elevations this year. So I'm not going to talk specifically about the deep margin elevation, but I am going to mention right now that this case is being handled with a deep margin elevation on that distal margin. So what I do then is I build up my core. In this particular case, I'm using Sonic Fill 3 from Cable Kerr. And Sonic Fill 3 is a bulk fill material that I really like for this type of procedures because I can fill everything up in one bulk all the way up to four millimeter thickness. And I don't need four millimeters thickness here because I'm going to prepare within that 
um, within that core builder material, within that resin that I'm using to elevate that floor and to give this tooth a special geometry. I don't need to have massive amount of ceramic, so I'm gonna build up with composite so that I can have less ceramic uh, uh, because again, I'm gonna protect the whole occlusal surface. You can see that I've already se uh, sectioned some of that occlusal surface down and that's where I'm gonna prep and, and, and have all my exposed enamel for my bonding. But once I do that, once I build everything up, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna finish my preparation. And again, I want you to visualize here all the enamel that I have surrounding this, this preparation. This is not a crown, this is an onlay type of preparation. I have a deep margin elevation on the distal, so my ceramic restoration is gonna, is gonna lay right on top of this margin elevation here. But look at the geometrical feature that I was able to uh, to uh, form within that preparation, just taking advantage of the actual uh, uh, access that the endodontist had to do in order for them to treat this tooth by means of a root canal. So it's not that I'm eliminating tooth structure, I'm eliminating composite to get this added feature that again is gonna allow this restoration to have one path of insertion, give it more stability so that the restoration doesn't go left and right and make it a lot easier at the time of delivery. So this type of features that are very unique and particular for endo crown restorations, which in the older technique were recommended to be done completely within the pulp chamber, two to three millimeters. Today, what I'm doing and what I recommend is not to go into the pulp chamber. Just seal your pulp chamber and go beyond the pulp chamber if you have enough tooth structure just to withstand and to hold your restoration in place. Because today we know that these restorations are made to reinforce the tooth and they are made for that and they are depending on that enamel in order for us to be able to reinforce the tooth. So this is our temporary, we remove the rubber dam, we have our temporary in place, we're gonna allow the tissue to heal, we're gonna allow everything to heal around our, our, mar our elevated margin, and then we're gonna go back you know, 15 days later and we're gonna check that tissue around the area where we elevated the margin. We wanna make sure that the tissue is nice and healthy, that there is no bleeding upon probing as you are seeing here in the photo, and that I am ready now to scan that preparation and send it to the lab to have a milled uh, Emax type of restoration as you are seeing here on my photo. Once you have this done, you already have a couple of questions that you have answered for yourself. You know that you have enough enamel, so you know that you're gonna be able to bond too well. You know that you're gonna be able to isolate because you did your whole preparation through the isolation. So you know that you have the best of both worlds. You're gonna, have a, you're gonna be able to achieve a very nice and clean uh, substrate uh, or surface area for you to be able to perform this bonding procedure well. Not only that you're gonna be able to perform the bonding procedure nice and clean and with good isolation, but you're gonna be able to bond to that best substrate that you have, which is the enamel. So again, the philosophy and the theory behind this, you preserve tooth structure. This is an occlusal view right after the restoration was delivered. And I wanna show you here, a side and a lingual view immediately after the restoration was bonded. You can see how much tooth structure I'm still, I still have available on the buckle. You can see how much tooth structure I still have available on the lingual and how much I have available on the mesial. On the only area where I needed to elevate that margin because there was a deep margin in, uh, 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 in that location was on the distal area that you, have, you see that I was able to manage it well. I have a, a, I have a full coverage occlusal type of restoration which is partially within that, uh, that geometrical feature that I designed to give this restoration an added stability and to help you the day of delivery but it's not completely in to the pulp chamber. So I'm not going into the pulp chamber two to three millimeters as it was recommended uh, many, many years ago, but now I'm just partially in there. And if I have enough enamel and I have a vital tooth, like the case uh, before, I don't even need to go in there. I can just w uh, keep my restoration in place by as much enamel as I can achieve around that periphery of my preparation. So again, I just want, uh, want, want to help you just kind of open your mind and kind of see this type of restorations and see how can they benefit your practice. Because there are, you know, in my mind at least and in my hands, there are a lot easier to prepare. There are a lot easier to deliver and to make, you know, to have isolation because everything is super gingival. Your dentistry is super gingival. So it's gonna be a lot easier for the patient to keep those, the interface between the restoration and the tooth cleaner, less, 
gingival inflammation, less gingival irritation over time. But most importantly, uh, you are maintaining as much natural tooth structure as possible. And this is now going to take me to my final uh, tip uh, of the day, tip and trick of the day, which is my tip and trick number three. And for this tip and trick, I want to just talk a little bit about the bonding of the restorations. And again, what you're seeing here on the screen, I'm going to share with you now two cases just to kind of give you a really good idea of how you go about this. The first thing that I want to, I want to share with you here, this is a second molar, a maxillary second molar. So I'm going to, I feel very, very comfortable and I have been doing these restorations for a good number of years and I feel very comfortable putting these restorations in any uh, uh, place of the mouth. So I don't, I'm not looking for a specific tooth. I'm not looking for a specific, if I have enough enamel and I have en enough remaining uh, uh, tooth structure that I can get some enamel from, I'm going to bond this restoration. I'm going to use an endo type of uh, restoration. This is an endo treated tooth. This is a non-vital tooth. You can see the root canal was performed. All I did was seal the root, the access and prep this geometrical feature within that core that I built into the tooth. So there was no excessive tooth structure removal. There is no excessive dental removal. This is literally what I got back from the endodontist after the a very large amalgam that the patient had on this tooth had fractured completely off. And we were now going to do a ceramic restoration on the occlusal surface of that tooth. Again, look at the amount of enamel. Think about that chamfer burr that I shared with you in the tip and trick number two and just think about the way that I'm going to prepare that tooth, right? You're going to go, you're going to put that chamfer aspect towards the buccal, towards the lingual, towards the mesial, towards the distal. You don't have to create any added features. You don't have to create any specific shape on the boxes. You can see that this distal box that I created here is a very shallow box just to kind of wrap around. I had a little bit of a, a decay on this area. So all I did was just to get into that area to get some enamel exposed and be able to bond my restoration well. All this, the core buildup and the preparation are done underneath a, a, a full uh, isolation of the tooth and I just do that because I'm, I have to isolate anyway in order for me to be able to build up my core so I just go ahead and prep right after that and and you know at the same time that I'm building my core I'm acid etching I'm putting my adhesive I'm sealing as much of the dentin as I can and then I'm exposing all this enamel around that restoration so now you're ready to cement your restoration you're to deliver to your bond your restoration so one of the things that I want to talk to you about uh, is the importance of understanding your materials, the materials that you are using in your practice. And I use, uh, for the, for these restorations, I sometimes select one coat seven universal from Coteen and I use their resin cements, uh, the dual cure resin cements to deliver these type of restorations. So one thing that I want you to understand is that many of the universals adhesive that we have, have a very acidic pH meaning that the pH is less than three. And sometimes some companies will tell you, hey, if you use my universal adhesive with my resin cement, there is, you don't have to worry about anything. Because don't forget, dual cure resin cements are affected by the acidity of the environment. So that if that acidity of the environment or the adhesive, it has an acidity that is less or a pH that is less than three, that dual cure cement is not going to dual cure completely. And that is going to affect the delivery of your restoration. It's going to affect the stability of your restoration once bonded to the tooth structure. And one example of that is one code seven, one code seven universal has a pH less than three. So Colteen makes this other bottle called the one coat activator. And there are many companies out there. 3M makes one for their product. There's a couple of companies out there that have the same issue, meaning that you cannot use their universal adhesive alone in order for you to bond a restoration with a dual cure resin composite. You have to use an activator to increase the pH of the universal adhesive and allow your resin cement to fully polymerize. This is very, very important that you understand because if you think about it, this restoration is only relying on the bonding efficacy of your technique. It's only relying on how good your bonding or delivery technique is. If that technique is not a good technique, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have debonded restoration. So please keep that in mind. 
Now, you have to figure this out because each company is different. I'm just giving you an example of one of the products that I use that I, that I, that I like a lot. So I want to make sure that I understand and I know this product very well. And I do know that one code seven universal in order for me to be able to use it with a dual cure resin composite cement or resin composite restorative material, I need to combine it with a one coat with the one coat activator made by the same company. So please keep that in mind. In this particular case, this is a non-vital tooth. I'm going to totally etch everything. I'm going to rinse and dry. And now this is the way that you use the adhesive. Your first coat is going to be, if you're using one coat seven universal, your first coat is going to be one drop of that one coat universal only. So you dispense one drop, you use that drop and you're going to apply it on the entire surface of the tooth. That is your first layer. Your second layer is going to be a combination of one drop of one coat seven with one drop of one coat activator. This is your second layer. So when you are going to bond restorations using dual cure resin cements, and you're going to combine these two materials, your first layer is the one coat universal only. And your second layer is a mix of one drop of each. The whole idea is that that activator is going to increase the pH and is going to now serve as your adhesive layer. So your first layer is going to serve as your primer layer. Your second layer is going to serve as your adhesive layer and your adhesive with a pH higher than three. So that that pH of that adhesive layer is not going to affect the uh, uh, curing properties of your dual cure cement. So once you apply that second layer and you thin it out, you like cure and you're ready to bond your restoration. In this particular case, I'm going to use Duo Sem, which is a dual cure resin cement made by Coltine. Uh, uh, and this comes in these little very nice uh, delivery system, auto mix type of system. So you deliver it directly into the restoration. I always add a little bit as well directly to the to the uh, to the substrate to the actual tooth that I'm going to be bonding to. So I have I, I add uh, to both to the restoration and to the tooth so that I have little chances for any type of air bubbles that are going to be left behind once I sit, I fully sit the restoration. And you can see right here, fully seating of the restoration, really, really good control of the operative field with my rubber dam isolation. And this is immediately after I deliver my restoration. And now I'm going to go ahead and adjust the occlusion and then finally polish the restoration and I'm ready to go. And as you can see, this is a very small tooth structure. And why is this? This is a very small tooth. I'm sorry. Very, the height of the tooth is very, very small. And we all know that it is a second molar all the way in the back of the, of the maxillary arch. But what I want you to understand is this. If you were to do a crown, a regular conventional crown preparation on this tooth, the question that you're going to ask yourself is this, how much tooth structure am I going to have available to, to hold that crown in place? And the answer is going to be very little to none. So you're going to have to now do a clinical crown lengthening procedure. You're going to have to do something in order for you to have enough uh, um, a, a crown height to, main to maintain a crown give stability to the crown once you deliver. In this type of restorations, you don't need to worry about that. And you don't worry about that because you're bonding these restorations to the best substrate possible, which is the enamel. So this is the beauty of these restorations. They allow you to be more conservative at the time of treatment. So please keep that in mind. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that many of you are already doing these type of restorations. And again, I'm sharing with you another second molar. This is a vital tooth. So I'm going to do something a little bit different here, but I'm going to use the same type of materials that I have been sharing with you right now. And as you can see, really good isolation. Look how small that tooth is that I'm using a W2 clamp. This is a second molar and I'm using a W2 clamp, which is a clamp made or designed for premolars on that second molar. That's how small that tooth is. So if that tooth is so small, how much of the tooth do I need in order for me to be able to deliver a regular crown? How am I going to be able to prepare that little tooth remove so much enamel, so much of the DJ, and then I have a really small height of the tooth. How am I going to keep a crown in place? But if I do an onlay type of restoration or a vonlay type of restoration or an endo crown, depending on the substrate that you have. And again, they're all the same, just very small features and designs uh, among them. Well, there's a lot less that you need to prepare. All I need here is one to 1.5 millimeter occlusal clearance. And all I need is 
360 degrees of nice enamel to bond to all around my preparation. So because this is deep dentin and this is a vital tooth, I'm going to do selective edge technique. So I'm going to only edge the enamel. And this is the beauty of using today you have the self etching uh, type of materials. And for cases like this, I like to use uh, extra universal from a uh, cable Kurt because this adhesive system, which is a self etching adhesive system comes in two separate bottles. So you have one bottle for the primer, one bottle for the adhesive, and this gives you much better control of that operative field of that dentin, of the depth of the of, of the infiltration of this resin into the dentin. You have a and, and there's many studies that have shown that the two bottle self etch systems perform clinically better than the single bottle self etching systems. So again, self etching here. I'm going to leave that deep dentin with no phosphoric acid. I'm going to rinse and dry, and then I'm going to use the self etching properties of this two bottle system extra universal, uh, OptiBond extra universal from Cable Cur, and I'm going to go ahead, you know, prime, bond, like cure that adhesive layer, and then I'm ready to deliver my restoration. And again, look how small that restoration is because the tooth was small to start with. So I don't have a lot of substrate. So this is a really good option for this particular case because I can keep this tooth vital because of the type of preparation that I'm doing, which is a very conservative, minimally invasive type of restoration that all I'm, that I'm looking for is one to 1.5 millimeter occlusal clearance and enamel 360 degrees around the, uh, the surface of that tooth so that I can go ahead and bond this restoration uh, without any um, inconvenience or any problems. And that was my final slide. I want to thank everybody for being part of this webinar today. This is the first one of the year, and hopefully you're going to join us in the future webinars that are going to come. And again, visit our webpage, and you will find a full calendar for the entire year of webinars, of free webinars that we are going to have. <laughs>